Poles are now exposed to the elements and could release radioactivity directly into the atmosphere. From the air, two Chinook helicopters began to douse the fuel pool of unit number three with seawater. The helicopters are retrofitted with lead plates to shield them from radiation. The pilots are also wearing full radiation suits. Sweeping in at high speeds to minimize exposure, the pilots drop their payload of 2,000 gallons of water. Their mission may have another benefit. They were really trying to scrub those potential isotopes being released from those pools rather than letting them continue to loft into the air. For plant managers, worker safety is an ongoing concern. As helicopters bombard the plant from above, electricians are sent deep into the basement of Unit 2. They struggle in hellish conditions to run electrical cables. Returning power is critical to stabilizing the plant, but there are radioactive hotspots everywhere. You have 20 minutes to get this cable from here to there. The thing's ticking how many minutes you have. They'll say you have 10 minutes left, you have nine minutes left, you have eight minutes left. And so they were under pressure to, to get the cable for the next team to come in and pull the cable the rest of the way so that they could get power back to the control room. All over Japan, things come to a standstill as people observe a moment of silence to honor the dead and missing from the tragedy that struck exactly one week ago. In Tokyo, officials raised the status of the nuclear crisis to level five. They're literally in combat. The stress levels have to be tremendous. Fukushima workers are now dealing with an accident on a par with the 1979 Three Mile Island crisis in Pennsylvania. Power is finally restored. The plant at Fukushima has outside electricity for the first time since the earthquake. But in Tokyo, fear is growing. Is the water safe to drink? The crisis hits home for the 13 million people of Tokyo. After multiple blasts at the Fukushima plant, helpful winds carried most of the radiation out to sea. But a change in the weather now sends radioactive particles 150 miles in the opposite direction, straight towards the capital. Experts believe rainfall is dumping the cancer-causing agent iodine-131 into reservoirs that supply water to the city. Officials announced that drinking water contains twice the legal limit set for infants. The announcement triggers a rush to stores and a run on supplies throughout the city. It's hard to buy a bottle of water in the store anymore because people have panicked. But some experts say the response is out of sync with reality that the level of radiation is not posing a serious threat to anyone's health. The issue is, what do these action levels mean? Can you drink that glass of water? Yeah. Can you drink 100 glasses of water like that? Absolutely. Your risk is not going to be any greater than if you take a transcontinental airplane flight. Officials in Tokyo announced that radiation levels have dropped and the water is once again safe to drink for everyone. But the news seems to have little impact. A sense of fear and betrayal is growing. What's safe to eat? Is it really safe to drink the water? My wife is pregnant now, so we're very worried. I'm afraid we'll all end up with radiation poisoning. I wish the government would take clearer steps to deal with the problem. At Fukushima, the battle to cool the reactors continues. It's been a frustrating process. One step forward, two steps back. Progress followed by complications. And now, one of those complications is seriously hindering operations. The massive amount of water being sprayed and pumped into the plant has nowhere to go. 
Radioactive water is spreading everywhere, but managers still send a team of electricians into a flooded section of Unit 3 in an effort to rewire control panels needed to activate pumps essential for normal cooling operations. They are working in basement, so it's pitch black. It's wet. They're on stopwatches. They know they can only be there so many minutes. 12.10 p.m. The water the electricians are slogging through turns out to be much more contaminated than expected. Two workers suffer radiation burns. They're evacuated to the hospital. The incident is alarming. So are new readings throughout the plant. The water in the basement of Unit 2 is blistering. It's more than 100,000 times higher than normal. The news sends shockwaves through the operation. Engineers suspect the problem might be in the reactor cores themselves. If they've been breached and are leaking, it would be terrible news. And as more earthquakes and aftershocks hit the region, Unit 2 appears to be especially vulnerable. One of the consequences of the feed and bleed mode is the more and more water you put into a containment structure that's receiving aftershocks and smaller earthquakes increases the chance that the structure fails or collapses due to all that additional weight. Another setback. An eight-inch crack is discovered in a concrete trench near reactor number two. Highly radioactive water is pouring directly into the ocean. Anything that missed the spent fuel pools or overflowed the spent fuel pools made its way back into the basement of the reactor building, and apparently some of it also got into the turbine building, which caused some problems. Workers attempt to plug the leak. Filling the trench with cement doesn't work. Neither does a polymer of sawdust and shredded paper. Finally, the leak is plugged successfully by injecting liquid glass directly into the bedrock beneath the trench. It's three and a half weeks into the crisis, and workers are waging battles on two major fronts. They're pumping water into the spent fuel pools and trying to figure out what to do with the radioactive water that's flooding the plant and crippling efforts to reconnect the cooling system. A decision is made to pump more than 11,000 tons of radioactive water directly into the sea. Despite reassurances from TEPCO officials, the maneuver is one more blow to an already nervous public. More than 200,000 have already been displaced. Now there are calls to expand the evacuation zone beyond 19 miles. People are beginning to wonder if things will ever return to normal at Fukushima. For the crews at Fukushima, the work has been grueling. But now, after a full month of hand-to-hand -hand combat, reinforcements arrive that will help the containment effort and the exhausted workers. It is heavy equipment, bulldozers, trucks, shovels, but these are remotely operated vehicles, unmanned robots that can be controlled from a safe distance. They're using robotics or remote controlled vehicles to push some of the debris out of the way that's very uh, radioactive, um, that's near the buildings where it's blocking their access to key, key functions. The debris is a humbling legacy for what had been one of Japan's most important power plants. The high-tech robotic operation is not limited to the ground. At 3.59 in the afternoon, an unmanned drone takes flight. Without having to worry about a pilot's exposure to radiation, the drone can hover over the site for extended periods, collecting critical data and capturing images of the reactor. The assessment from officials in Tokyo is sobering. They acknowledge what many have feared all along. There has been a widespread release of radioactive material extending far beyond the borders of Japan. The situation at Fukushima is officially raised to a level seven major accident, the highest disaster rating for nuclear power plants.
Despite suspicions of partial meltdowns in the three reactors that were operating when the disaster struck, pressure in those cores now seems under control. No one is declaring victory, but after 33 harrowing days, it appears that the workers have at least achieved something of a stalemate. What has most impressed you about what you've heard about what those workers have been up against and what they've been willing to do. What's impressed me the most is uh, the length of time they've been dealing with this, and it hasn't changed much. Control will be regained over the core cooling and the spent fuel pool cooling. I'm not sure whether it will be this week, next month, or next quarter, but at some point, that's going to happen. Then we can shift from a crisis management mode into a recovery mode. It's been 25 years since the Chernobyl accident, and there is still a 1,600 square mile exclusion zone surrounding that plant. What will the recovery look like in Fukushima? Will fishermen ever return to reap the bounty of the sea? How long will farmland be abandoned? What will the disaster mean for people whose way of life has been tied to this land for generations? They've probably, in many cases, lived in those towns and in those prefectures in their entire life. To be resettled in suburban Tokyo or Osaka or somewhere else must be incredibly disruptive uh, and sad. Even though it sits in an earthquake zone right on the ocean, the Fukushima plant was not built in defiance of Mother Nature. Designers were confident the plant would withstand earthquakes and tsunamis. Many nuclear plants in the United States are also located near earthquake fault lines or along the coast. 23 American plants use the same containment system that failed at Fukushima. Are American nuclear plants vulnerable? I think one of the lessons learned from Fukushima is that the, the scope of the disaster could be so large that it may overwhelm our emergency response capabilities as it did in Japan. Around the world, there are more than 400 plants in operation. Can we really plan for every contingency? Is it possible to guarantee the safety of nuclear power? The future may be beyond our vision. The question remains if it's beyond our control. I don't know what the world is going to do following Fukushima, and none of us will know till months go by or years go by. No one knows when the crisis inside the plant will end, nor what the tragedy will mean for the future of the people who call Fukushima home. In America, about a third of our population lives within 50 miles of a nuclear power plant. Around 20 million people live near the Indian Point plant behind me. In the wake of the accident in Japan, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was ordered to look at every plant in the U.S. to see how safe they would be in an earthquake or other disaster. I'm Paula Zahn. Thanks for joining us.